Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks also for the organizers for inviting me. I uh, indeed want to apologize for changing the title at the last minute. There are two reasons for this. The topic uh, that I had in mind when I gave the previous title will remain the focus of this talk, so it's not like you have lost everything. Um, the reason I changed the title is twofold. One is, um, shortly after I gave the title way in advance, I um, stopped dislike. I, I stopped liking it. And the second one is that when I was preparing the slides, I didn't remember the title that I uh, gave. And so for this reason, you have a new one. But the topic is, is the same. And indeed, I should say that the the topic of today will be developed in the three talks uh, that are coming up um, when, uh, and uh, will culminate on, on Wednesday. So there might be some questions that you'll have after this talk that I hope to address at least um, in the last talk on Wednesday that I'll give. All right. Um, the title uh, is, of course, an allusion, the one that you have here, is, of course, an allusion to um, a paper by Chomsky called Some Evo Devo Theses for the Language Faculty, where he revisited uh, some of the issues uh, that he addressed with Hauser and, and Fitch in the famous um, or infamous, depending on your allegiance, 2002 uh, science article. And I want to basically... Um, take that paper, or indeed the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch discussion as a starting point for this talk and tell you that um, the many people who have sort of followed the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch line, and they seem to me to be many in the generative camp, um, have been wrong in many ways. That is, there are serious problems, I think, with the way uh, questions were framed in the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch paper and I'd like to correct at least uh, some of them uh, today. Um, just to help you follow the talk, um, let me give you just two warnings. Uh, the first one is um, there's not going to be any specific data from any specific language in this talk. This is a tradition that I uh, you know, usually follow uh, when I come to Japan. And I usually say, and indeed I believe that this is progress for biolinguistics, that is we should move away from uh, specific languages and focus on the language faculty instead. And the second um, hint or help that I'll give you is that uh, this talk will in part address a point that uh, Ray Jackendorf uh, has made several times when he said that when you do biolinguistics, or specifically when you study the evolution of language, what you do when you address that topic depends, according to Jakadov, and he's right, on the type of theory of language that you have in mind. That is, your view of language will also affect your view of bilinguistics or your view of uh, the evolution of language. Uh, this is close to a truism, but what's, uh, what's not often mentioned, and what Jakadov certainly doesn't mention, is that your view of the evolution of language or of biolinguistics also depend on your view of what biology is or what evolution can actually give rise to. And that's usually sort of taken for granted by uh, linguists in particular, but I think that there are reasons for uh, being as open on the biology side than we um, should be open on the, on the linguistic theory side, and this is what I will try to do today. Um, so, I will start with um, a sort of a, a brief description of some of the activities that take place in Evo Devo research, so the field on evolution and, and development. And I'll start with, a, a, with an authority in the field, uh, Müller from Vienna, who says that the organismal form, shape, morphological structure, and the generative mechanisms underlying their evolution represent the, essen the essential questions uh, within Evo Devo. So if you want to explore certain Evo Devo theses, uh, make sure that those theses pertain to the topics that uh, uh, I just mentioned. And of course, if you're generative grammarians, you must feel very happy that the word uh, generative uh, came up in this quote. Um, it's not innocent, of course, um, but it's not as... Uh, as related as you might think to generative grammar. Okay. 
One of the key issues um, in Evo Devo is figur figuring out the origins of novelty, both in development and in evolution. On the right hand column, you have a particular um, illustration of novelty having to do with um, basically a novel uh, complex phenotype that people have uh, been worrying about. And they've realized that the origins of novel complex phenotypes, and if you think of language, this is good, uh, represent one of the most fundamental yet largely unresolved issues in evolutionary biology. As everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, he did not address the origin of species, right? He actually said somewhere that the origin problem is too hard, so let's leave it for somebody else. Okay. And it's often stated in the Evodivo literature that while biologists have made great progress over the past century and a half in understanding how existing traits diversify, um, relatively little progress has been made in understanding how novel traits um, you know, come into being in the first place. Um, and here I'm not talking specifically about a very famous, perhaps the most famous um, topic in Evo Devo having to do with uh, the conservation of genes, like for example Hux genes. I'm talking about not so much uh, the genetic basis of novelty, but simply how novelty could arise even outside of a um, genomic uh, framework. Okay, So the picture that I showed you earlier uh, this one on the right hand side has to do with uh, beetle horns, which is a class of traits that lacks obvious homology to traits in other insects. And it's been uh, well demonstrated that these horns are remarkably diverse in their expression, um, male and female uh, differences, and even um, differences across various um, species. Uh, both pertaining to location and also shape of uh, the horn. Okay? But it's also known uh, that, that while we have this diversity and this novelty um, in that particular realm of biology, at the same time beetle horns share aspects of their development with that of more traditional appendices. Um, so here we have an example out of many of a novel trait that's both so different from anything else that we want to say it's very specific and distinct, but at the same time biologists recognize that the, this novel aspect also is not completely novel, that it, it shares uh, properties with other things that you find in other species. And the question is, of course, uh, whether when I tell you this about the beetle horns, whether you were tempted to think about um, this paper um, by Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch, where they introduced the famous FLN FLB distinction, recognizing that there are some aspects of this trait that we call language, that um, aspects that are novel, and other aspects uh, that are shared. In this particular framework, um, uh, sketched in Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch based on the FLN FLB distinction seems to me to have been taken um, as a starting you know, assumption or as, as a good framework for framing questions in biolinguistics and especially given the definition of novelty that we find in the Evo Devo literature. So this is outside of language. This is again by Muller and a friend of his, Wagner, in 2001, who defined novelty as follows. A novelty in the biological world is a structure that is neither homologous to any structure in the ancestral species, nor homologous to any other structure of the same organism. Okay? So if you start thinking of FLN as something that is both unique and specific to language and to humans, uh, you fit right in there in the definition of novelty. So according to, um, if you've read Muller and Wagner, you might, and you have read Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch, you might be tempted to say, well, the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch is a great Evo Devo paper. It sketches a program centered on the distinction between FLN and FLB, and especially the FLN part fits precisely in the definition of 
novelty or novel trait that uh, has been given independently in the biology literature. So isn't it great we are finally doing biology, you might say, if you've uh, read the House of Chomsky and Fitch. And I'll tell you it's wrong. That is, I'll tell you that even though the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch paper at times reads like an Evo Devo paper, it is not an Evo Devo paper. And in fact, it fails in many interesting ways uh, that I think could be corrected so that it could become an Evo Devo paper. And this is what the title, some other Evo Devo theses uh, for language, was alluding to. Okay? So this is the FLN, FLB. Um, schema and that appears in the 2002 paper. I'm not going to go through it because I'm uh, sure most people are familiar with it. Um, but I will come back to certain particular aspects of that schema at various points in the talk. In particular, the fact that Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch at various times in the paper, both in the 2002 paper and in the 2005 reply to Pinker and Jakinov, place FLN as a um, proper subset of um, FLB. And this I will take um, issue with. Okay? Um, just to be on the safe side, I'll repeat a couple of things that Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch mentioned in their paper so that it co it's common knowledge among all of us, and then we can debate whether it's really as they say or not. Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch point out <coughs> that something about the faculty of language must be unique in order to explain the differences between humans and the other animals. So a running theme of the paper is the uniqueness of at least some aspects of the language faculty. And they continue pointing out that linguists and biologists, along with researchers in other fields, can move beyond unproductive theoretical debate to a more collaborative effort if actually they recognize uh, a distinction that they introduce or that they make uh, really important, the FLN, FLB distinction. I've hesitated a little bit like a moment ago in saying that the FLN, FLB distinction was introduced by Hazard, Chomsky, and Fitch. The reason for me doing so is because actually someone else uh, introduced the FLN, FLB distinction. Um, and it's actually, ironically, Ray Jackendorf in 1987, um, uh, where he proposed something similar. Okay. But the important thing about this quote is how the Chomsky and Fitch insist that if you have an FLB, FLN distinction that's very clear in your mind, then you can move beyond a productive debate. Right away, I want to point out that, as you probably have realized in the intervening years, the debate surrounding the House of Chomsky and Fitch paper hasn't particularly been of the productive kind, one should say. So perhaps they were wrong about this. And as far as I can see, most of the debate, uh, most of the substance of the debate revolves around how to define the FLN, FLB distinction and what to put in it. And I'll tell you that the reason that debate has been unproductive is the FLN, FLB distinction wasn't a good one to begin with. Okay? Nevertheless, in um, Fitch, Hauser, and Chomsky 2005, mm, they say that it seems likely that some subset, right, and here I stress subset, of the mechanisms of FLB is both unique to humans and to language itself. And um, these, this subset of mechanisms is what they call FLN. So it's both unique to humans and um, to language. Okay? This is a slide reminding you of um, the fact that, if anything, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch should have talked a little bit more uh, among themselves before writing the paper, at least uh, when they um, described the content uh, that they were tempted to put in FLN. Because here are like four different uh, passages of the original 2002 paper giving you different things included in FLN. Sometimes it's only a recursion, sometimes it's recursion and the mapping, sometimes it's at least recursion, and so on and so forth. Okay? And this has been part of the controversy, but I don't think that this is the particularly, like, m the most problematic aspect of the paper. As far as I can see, even people taking issue with the recursion thesis as FLN uh, assume that there is something right about the FLN FLB distinction. Uh, what people debate is uh, what fits in FLN or what fits in FLB. Okay? 
Um, and again, just to emphasize, they really state that this FLN-FLB distinction is crucial for protective biolinguistics, if you want. Okay? So it came as a surprise to me that uh, one of the three authors of the House of Chomsky and Fitch wrote in 2010, not that many years after the paper, the following. Here's uh, um, two excerpts from Fitch 2010. What all of these examples, and you don't have to know about them, it's in, in his paper, make clear is that the distinction between general and linguistically specialized mechanisms is hard to draw. True. Even in those cases where the mechanisms themselves seem fairly clearly defined, most areas of language are not and will not soon be so clearly defined, and thus the distinction itself, that is between general, shared, and specific, unique, um, the distinction itself is of little use in furthering our understanding of the mechanisms. This is Fitch talking, basically concluding that something like the FLN-FLB distinction is uh, not useful uh, for uh, biologically informed debate, if you want. Okay? And he goes on saying, arguments about whether the constraints are general to cognition or specific to language or to humans are, in my opinion, unlikely to help resolve the substantive biological issues involved in understanding the FLB. And when you read this, you should scratch your head and say, but isn't it the guy who said that the FLN-FLB distinction was crucial for productive debate? And yes, that's the guy. Okay. All right. Um, in that literature surrounding the FLN-FLB distinction, you find many passages like the following. This is taken from a recent uh, Nature Reviews a paper about uh, bird songs, concluding the paper by saying, perhaps this is a good time to reconsider whether attempting to distinguish between qualitative and quantitative differences is helpful if the quantitative advantage is vast. So they are talking about basically FLN, FLB, and saying that perhaps we should reconsider the usefulness of this uh, distinction. Okay. Jackendorf and Pinker made an early point, um, roughly in, uh, along these lines, saying that the narrow broad dichotomy, which makes space only for completely novel capacities and for capacities taken intact from non-linguistic and non-human capacities, omitting capacities that may have been substantially modified in the course of human evolution. And then they go on saying, that distinction is, is not so good, precisely because it seems to exclude a couple of possibilities that what may want um, to uh, consider. The distinction, and I think Jackendorf and Pinker are right about this, is uh, very sharp indeed. That is, they want to say either it's completely novel or it's completely shared. Okay. And they claim that um, with this FLN-FLB distinction, some hypotheses, in their view, Jackanoff and Pinker, the most plausible ones, become impossible to state, or at the very least, very, very difficult to state. And this is a point that I will emphasize, because I think Jackanoff and Pinker were on the right track here. That is, they were correct in pointing out that there are some biologically plausible theses um, about language or organisms in general that one wants to state or one would like to explore, but they are very, very hard to state given the FLN-FLB schema that's in the House of Chomsky and Fitch, okay? namely this one where FLN is a subset of FLB. And I'll give you a hint first and then I'll give you more details uh, further. Consider this picture. This is a famous painting that many of you, I'm sure, uh, know. Um, you immediately recognize that this is someone's portrait, but you also recognize that the portrait, at least if the image is uh, clear enough, that this portrait is composed of um, vegetables arranged in a particular way. And so you might, if I were to ask you, what is this, a portrait or a bunch of vegetables arranged in a particular way, uh, you might be hard-pressed to give me a satisfactory answer. In some respects, it's a bunch of vegetables, but it's also something more than that. That is, the arrangement gives rise to a particular entity, in, in this case, the portrait. And it would be hard to say that the portrait is a subset of the arrangement of vegetables. Okay? And likewise, I'll tell you that putting FLN as a subset of FLB um, makes it difficult to entertain certain things 
certain hypotheses according to which FLN could be like the conjunction of things that are shared with other species but that are uniquely arranged in uh, humans. All right. Um, yeah. There is another problem, I should say, with the Hazard, Chomsky, and Fitch paper. Namely, they say, at least at one point in the paper, that FLN comprises only those core computational mechanisms of recursion as they appear in narrow syntax and the mappings uh, to the interfaces. Jackanoff and Pinker pointed out that the claim is rather uninteresting because mapping to the interfaces is left vague in both articles, that is the 2002 and the 2005 articles. And this is true, but what is also left vague uh, is um, this part, namely when Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch talk about the core computational mechanisms of recursions. Nowhere in uh, the 2002 paper, nor in fact in the 2005 paper, are we given those mechanisms. Uh, that is, in the absence of the actual mechanisms of recursion, um, it's very hard to actually debate the issue. Okay? And I think partly uh, this, this accounts for why uh, people have been debated is, is recursion unique to humans or unique to language. It's because in the absence of mechanisms, it's very difficult to test uh, that particular claim. Okay? Um, yes, I'll skip uh, some parts. Okay. And what I would like to tell you is that uh, what I said already at the beginning of the talk, um, one of the things that one should do in order to do, I think, proper biolinguistics is not so much worry about the type of theory of language that one assumes, but also the type of biology that one assumes. That is, very, um, very infrequently uh, do linguists uh, turn to the non-linguistic literatures to see whether what they are saying actually makes sense. That is, one should ask, is the FLN-FLB distinction sound on biological grounds? Forget about the linguistic grounds, but how about more general biolo uh, biological grounds? And I think that here we'll see that the uh, distinction is uh, not quite so well-founded. Precisely because um, we are not given many of the mechanisms in the original papers, and that makes it uh, very difficult to combine the hauser chomsky fitch hypothesis that at first looks like an Evo-Devo paper with the actual Evo-Devo literature where mechanisms matter a lot. One thing that I should mention um, in this context is what Fitch, Chomsky, and Hauser write in 2005, that is the subsequent paper, they say something about, like this. Something about the faculty of language must be unique in order to explain the differences between humans and the other animals. So far so good. This is something that I've already uh, quoted from. But then they add, if only, so th they say what is unique? Well, perhaps it's only the particular combination of mechanisms in FLB. Okay? So they recognize this as a possible Mm, state of affairs. That is, um, what makes language special is the particular combination of mechanisms, all of which would be shared, that is, all of which would be part of FLB. But then, if this particular combination of mechanisms part of FLB gives rise to what's specific to language and specific to humans, then it's very hard to still insist on FLN being a subset of FLB, right? as I'm sure uh, is very clear to every one of you, okay? So here's a hypothesis that I should state right away is actually the hypothesis that most biologists would actually favor, especially in the Evo-Devo literature, for reasons we'll see. So here is a hypothesis that Fitch, Chomsky, and Hauser recognize, but what they fail to recognize is that there is a discrepancy between this particular hypothesis and the schema they propose in uh, 2002. Okay. Uh, Chomsky has occasionally uh, thought about this possibility, namely that FLN, well, or, you know, this is um, an anachrony, but what we today would call FLN would be just the result of a combination of FLB ingredients. Um, 
I, as far as I know, he first um, thought about this in rules and representations in 1980, but he came back to this possibility in, in a more recent paper in 2000 and says this. Now, a question that could be asked is whether whatever is innate about language is specific to l the language faculty or whether it's just some combination of the other aspects of the mind. Chomsky says that this is an empirical question. Thank you very much. And there is no reason to be dogmatic about it. Okay, we do science, not religion. Uh, you look and you see, he says, although it's, of course, more difficult than you just look and you see, right? Um, but Chomsky insists that what we seem to find is that it's specific. That is, he insists that there is something that's not shared, right? And think about this portrait again, because we'll come back to it, okay? But when you turn to the Evo Devo literature, they tell you that phenotyp uh, phenotypic novelty is largely reorganizational. Rather than, as a pr rather than, say, a product of innovative genes. That is, very often, the way you get novelty is by recombining all parts, okay? Um, and if you make FLN, if you try to say FLN is that, uh, but FLN is a subset of FLB, it's very hard. Okay. All right, so... Now I'm going to move to the biology literature and give you snippets of that literature to show you that uh, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch uh, put us on the wrong track. Okay? I repeat the definition of novelty, so a structure that's neither homologous to any structure in the ancestral species nor homologous to any other structure of uh, the same organism. So neither specific to humans nor specific to language in the context of language. That would be FLN. Okay? Now, I should say as well, that novelty is really a, an evo devo uh, focus of research. Before the, uh, the rise of evo devo as a productive field of study, uh, novelty was considered an explanatory deficit of the modern synthesis, that is the consensus um, view in biology until mm, about 20 years or so ago. Ernst Meyer, sometimes called the Darwin of uh, the um, 20th century, wrote the following in 1960. He's one of the few people who actually identified novelty as something to worry about for biologists, even though it seems so obvious, but, you know, uh, at the time it wasn't so obvious to many biologists. And Ernst Meyer had this to say. The problem of the emergence of evolutionary novelties has undoubtedly been greatly neglected during the past two or three decades, in spite of its importance in the theory of evolution. But then, what he says is that um, it's been neglected, and we have very little to say about it, okay, 1960. That is, until the rise of Evo Devo, there wasn't much of a theory about how to think about these evolutionary novelties. The modern synthesis was great um, with things that were already in place and then uh, diversified. They were great in saying, in this particular ecological context, this particular variant is selected as opposed to that other particular variant. But how those variants emerge in the first place that was left for somebody else. Until people like Muller came about in uh, were began to, to be clear about what um, novelties could be and crucially what would be the mechanisms um, that give rise um, to them. And Miller distinguishes um, among three types of novelty, so three different circumstances in the biological world under which we might want to use the word novelty. The first one that he calls emergent novelty is uh, refers to um, the, essentially the very beginning of life, of biological life, where um, multicellular assemblies um, you know, came about. And Miller says, this is a type of novelty that we would like to study. That is, how come that unicellular um, organisms basically got together and gave rise to a multicellular assembly? Type 2 novelty is way past the origin of biological life where discrete new elements emerge, for example, the horns, and after talking to Miller, uh, I can tell you that he would also place uh, language in there. And then there is a type 3 novelty, which is an individualization of existing elements 
And that, according to Muller, is called variational novelty, and it's the sort of thing that the modern synthesis was very good at dealing with, how uh, certain variants got selected, and then uh, you know, a particular configuration of the population uh, uh, emerged. And type 3 novelty basically is a good style, um, traditional, modern synthesis-based uh, biology. And what Evo Devo focuses on is type 1 and type 2, and in fact, more specifically type 2. They try to understand how discrete new elements uh, got into body plants, for example. Okay? Um, all right. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of how discrete new elements are dealt with in the literature. Again, the horns will serve an ex as, as a good example. For example, this paper by Moshek and Rose, a very recent one, but I think very comprehensive, talk about differential recruitment of limb patterning genes during development that gives r to give rise to certain horns that don't seem to be shared uh, in the biological world. What they do is actually demonstrate the differential co-option of appendage patterning genes during the evolution could actually give rise to novel structures. But what they crucially then stress is that what's being recruited is, of course, shared with other species. But a, pic a particular type of recruitment or a particular type of organization of these structures give rise to novel traits. Okay? And so, crucially, they wouldn't say that the horns or the mechanisms responsible for the horns are a subset of shared um, uh, ingredients for for that particular uh, capacity. Okay, I'll skip uh, this part. Uh, it's just to give you three, two or three more examples where people really assume that you can only get discrete new elements from uh, what's already available and shared with other species. Okay, that's actually contrary to. So it's a little bit ironic that the Hauser Chomskin Fitch paper was written at least in part because it was thought to be more in line with the biology of the time, more in line with the story of descent with modification that Darwin would have favored. But actually the way they phrased the uh, distinction, insisting on the uniqueness of FLN, uh, I think makes that particular project um, fail. Okay, I'll skip some parts. And I'll give you now... Uh, um, a very brief sketch of how Alan Turing asked us to think about biological novelty. And you'll see that if we had followed Turing's thesis, uh, we would have come up with something very different from the Hauser Chomsky and Fitch hypothesis about FLN and FLB. I put uh, on this slide, Turing's real thesis, real in bracket, because this is also a quote from a recent Chomsky talk, at least, where he talks about Turing's thesis. And I think that the Turing thesis he has in mind is actually different from the thesis that Turing um, had in mind. And you'll see why. The, the particular thesis that Turing uh, proposed goes back to 1952 in a paper on the morphogenesis uh, that's well known in the world of um, theoretical biology, at least, and that could be, I think, a good source of inspiration for biolinguists. And the paper focuses on uh, patterns of code patterns on various animals, uh, the big cats, the frogs, the zebra, and so on. Um, Turing was very much intrigued uh, by these patterns. He recognized them as novel structures, and he wanted to understand how these patterns um, emerge. In, uh, in a mechanistic way. That is, he didn't want just a description, he wanted to provide mechanisms that could give rise uh, to these patterns, okay? And this is actually the equation that he proposed. I'm not going to go into the details. There are basically two mechanisms that Turing um, needed. One is um, local autocatalysis and uh, lateral inhibition. inhibition. And these are the two equations that give rise to basically uh, the patterns that you find on the big cats. What's not, this is, the details are not important for today. They will become more important for the talk that I'll give on Wednesday. But what's important is how biologists read uh, Turing's paper these days. 
I'm going to give you uh, passages from a very interesting paper by a theoretical biologist at Oxford, Philip Maney, who talks about the impact of Turing's work on pattern formation in biology. And I will relay these quotes to the House of Chomsky Fitch paper. Here is what Ma Maney says about uh, Turing's hypothesis. Remarkably, Maney said, uh, Turing showed that under certain conditions, a system could exhibit spatially uniform steady states which were stable in the absence of diffusion, but which were driven unstable by diffusion. Diffusion is basically the, um, um, the core um, result of the interaction between the two equations that uh, I gave you earlier. And what Maney said is that Turing's hypothesis, his central thesis, is actually highly counterintuitive because basically it says that one can take a system which has a stabilizing reaction kinetics, add to it diffusion, and the resultant system becomes unstable. That is, you put two stabilizing components and you let them interact, and surprisingly, the interaction gives rise to instability. And this is what many is highly counterintuitive, because, and now you'll see the connection with Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch, sometimes when you put ingredients that have properties of their own, and you let them interact, the resulting picture is unexpected. Even though you know properties of each and every individual component, the interaction of these components gives rise to structures that cannot always be predicted from um, the properties of those uh, components. And I think this is a thesis that Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch failed to take into account in the context of language. Many is right to show that Turing probably gave an example of an emergent property that is two stabilizing condition giving rise to instability, okay? And showed, that is Turing, that complex phenomena can arise as the result of the integration of fundamental units, each one of which lack the properties that you want to explain ultimately. And biologists are now beginning to realize that identifying the individual components for example, like what people do following Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. Is this component part of FLN? Is this component part of FLB? Well, biologists are now beginning to realize, actually they have realized it for 20 years, that identifying the individual components is not enough. And that in order to understand the process of development, it's essential to see how these individual components interact. This is something that's absent from the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch discussion and subsequent literature. Okay. Um, I'll skip these parts, okay, and stress one thing, um, and I think I'll have to uh, conclude after this, is that the origin of novel traits is indeed what draws many to evolutionary biology, and I think that FLN is really what draws many to not only linguistics, but to biolinguistics, okay? But in order to understand the origin of novel traits, okay, um, it's very, very important to be clear about uh, the mechanisms that underlie the, mm, the genesis of novelty. And the main message I wanted to give you today, if only to prepare you for the hypothesis that I sketch on Wednesday, is that even though the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch paper sort of primed this topic of evolutionary novelty, defining FLN exactly like the way novelty is defined in the Evo Devo literature, they never get, they, they, they fail to do two things, which is why I think it, they don't provide a good departure for um, biolinguistics. One is they fail to provide the mechanisms, uh, for example, those that underlie recursion. They specifically talk about mechanisms of recursion, but they never say uh, which ones they are. In the absence of mechanism, you can't go very far. If only because in the absence of the mechanisms, you don't know how shared components could interact in a particular way to give rise to novelty, following Turing's thesis. Secondly, they basically placed FLN as a subset on F of FLB, and that, I think, was I think a mistake because it prevented 
if you follow that framework, of course, it would prevent you from actually looking into hypotheses, for example, like the one Turing suggested in 1952, where shared components have whatever properties they have in isolation, but once they interact, they give rise to unexpected results. This is something that you can't do um, if you adopt the FLN-FLB distinction, because if you start with shared components, you'll be talking about FLB, but their interactions may give rise to what you would be tempted to call FLN. And as a result, whichever way you go, uh, you won't be able to say this is FLN or this is FLB. It's actually both. And so on this note, um, I will end urging you to uh, reconsider uh, what many take to be a good framework for biolinguistic discussion, for fruitful um, biologically informed uh, linguistics and uh, consider hypotheses, for example, like the one uh, Turing gave and uh, come Wednesday for a particular instantiation of uh, Turing's uh, thesis. Thank you. I'll make a brief comment on this if I can. Well, this is the point. I think just like you mentioned a deficit, I think linguists suffer from that deficit too. They can only see FLN when uh, what they should see is also FLN, FLB. Well, okay, now I'm coming to FLN and FLB. What you say about, you know, Turing having two stabilizing processes that work together and they give him stability, or, you know, in, in physics you have two symmetry generating processes that bring it together give you an asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Well, wouldn't it really be, I mean, the interfaces, so everything you say, instead of having it explain the origin of F and N, it can explain language, the merging of language as F and N and the interfaces. When you have the interfaces, you're bringing together these things. And basically, F and N plus the interfaces is language. Why do you want to have these applied to the explanation of FLN rather than having it as an explanation of FLN and the interface? Um, perhaps because I'm more ambitious than that. That is, um, perhaps I, I think that, um, no, I, I think it's an, an, an an important question, but I think it reveals sort of the limitations of the Hauser Chomsky and Fitch program again. Why? Because in your comment, you assume that um, there is something discrete and unique, call it syntax, call it FLN, but that means there is something that we refuse to investigate normally. That is, we assume that there is a discrete element and, and we don't ask how that one comes about. I I'm sure you won't. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. Uh, no, but I think that uh, perhaps you're an exception, but the vast majority that rely on the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch paper as, as just a starting point for discussion really come into this frame of mind as, as having certain components of what we call language, and there we can say it's syntax, it's FLN, whatever you want, but that assumes that those discrete elements are really unique um, not only to humans but also to language. And that, I think, is just a wrong way of approaching what most people would recognize as an interesting phenomenon, syntax, FLN, again, call it whatever you want. We have to basically begin to decompose whatever is syntax, what, 
every Zephelen, and ask whether even that one could be the result of a recombination of shared components that neither one of them will actually correspond to syntax of FLN, but all together, put in a particular way, could. Ten seconds more. You're perfectly right. That, that paper wasn't really Ivo Digo, but they are now, you know, you know in, in, in the country where you now live, you know, Lorenzo Long and Valerie and so on, so that, that there are integrations between Ivo Digo and linguistics. Yeah, yeah, but... Very promising. Yeah, although, again, ten seconds. What I think is... is um, is sad is that that literature is actually extremely marginalized in the context of biolinguistics precisely because they provide a better framework than how the Chomsky and Fitch did. from Canada University in Genesis Studies. Um, I'm sorry that I haven't read the, the chum, uh, How the Chunks in Fish, and then I don't know whether I'm really right to give any questions. But my feeling is that, uh, uh, let's see, um, the, the, at the very first uh, sort of uh, oh, yeah, uh, uh, thing that uh, and, uh, Vichita San you know, said it was uh, maybe Chomsky was so, sort of uh, trying to identify language more like uh, say, snowflake. And he, I, thought, I thought he was um, in the same paper. He, Chomsky was uh, sort of comparing the, the view like uh, in the language, uh, language not uh, like a meteor, me, meteorology, me, meteorology or mm. weather. Mm. To say that, uh, okay, two systems, like, you know, predictor two systems get together and uh, mm. some, something unexpected mm. happen mm. could be sort of like meteorology kind of thing. So if we say that uh, that fact should be accounted for in in, in, in sort of in doing some re uh, uh, research, mm -hmm. then I, I kind of feel that uh, maybe you, you are sort of opening up too much. Uh, don't you want to say that maybe this uh, uh, FNN could be like a snowflake, an uh, ASCA type of thing? And that, that, that is the one we are sort of at least uh, wants to defend rather than just open up to the debate about that. What's the name of the person? I forgot that the person who said that the two systems get together. Uh, Turing. Yeah, Turing. Okay. Yeah. That, that was my, my sort of well, uh, notice. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the thing is that um, it's okay to say, for example, language is like a snowflake. Um, but one should realize that this is fine to start with. But the claim is almost empty, right? I mean, it sounds good. Um, but it doesn't mean very much until you actually say, okay, what are the mechanisms that give rise to the snowflake, okay? And then you have to ask, if you say language is like a snowflake, what are the mechanisms that give rise to language that would, you know, be equivalent to the mechanisms of the snowflake? And usually the people that say language is like a snowflake don't have that type of investigation in mind. I mean, it's more like a poetic statement than, uh, than, a, than, than a field of research. And if we want bilinguistics to be a field of research, then we should either say the, the molecular mechanisms giving rise to the snowflake are what gives rise to language, and I don't know of anyone that makes that claim, okay? Or else what? Right? You see, this is the pap this is the problem that until we give we we are clear about mechanisms. Yeah, you can say language is like anything you want, um, but um, but I don't think that it will lead to productive discussion. This is the point that I really take issue with uh, with Hazard Chomsky and Fitch, because they insist on a distinction in order to yield to a more productive debate with biologists. And actually, that, dis that distinction not only opens up the discussion, it acts as a major obstacle for that, for that discussion. So just the opposite of what they claim uh, should happen. Because human language is something unique. Right? So they have 
That's the problem, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. that, that's I can write with, with you, but I wouldn't be so radical saying, no, that's not so good. That's an hypothesis, right? No, that's not what I said, actually. So I don't take issue with whatever people put in FLN or FLB. What I take issue with is the way they phrase the question. Is this FLN? Is this FLB? And with that, we just can't go to the biologists. It's interesting that you mentioned Turing's uh, idea that two uh, stabilizing conditions can give destabilization or innovation. And, and there's the other counterpart, which uh, E.D. E. is well known for, for example, where chaotic systems, if they really are chaotic, actually eventually turn out with order. So I'm very anxious to hear what you'll have to say, because I'm going to take the conclusion sense and try to sort of how uh, we could use that actually mm -hmm. to, to get some innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, but, mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, actually, I, I should say that these uh, these are not like polar opposites, mm -hmm. right? They are influenced by the same school. In fact, Prigogine was a student of Turing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the uh, I'm, I was not focusing specifically on, you know, on the fact that two's mm, stabilizing component gives rise to instability. What I was focusing on was a more general point, namely, you can get really unexpected results from letting mm, banal properties interact. And I think that's what linguists, or biolinguists if you want, um, haven't learned yet from the biology literature. They still assume that in order to give uh, in order to obtain an unexpected macro result, like a general feature or trait, like language, they have to uh, give. They have to assume some really exceptional atoms to begin with that will eventually give rise to the no longer unexpected result, because they build the unexpectedness into their atoms to begin with. 
That's what that's a lesson that we really haven't learned from the biologists. They've learned that even if you start from um, uninteresting atoms of computations, the computation can get really far more interesting uh, than you thought. And linguists haven't learned that. And, we, and, and biologists also can be interesting and interested should be because each species is individual. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What's unique to us? Uh, well, you know, there is going to be another property. The trunk of the elephant is also unique to the elephant. I have some general, you know, comments. I think this idea of relating um, properties of language to other systems, be it cognitive or perceptual or deeper biological principles, is certainly fine. Um, but I'm not as hopeful as either you or some other folks. Um, so if you take some look at some adjacent um, interface you know, systems like vision, right? So um, the progress in vision, I think, is, is actually, oh yeah, put it bluntly, we understand language much better than we understand any other system. Um, having to do, uh, remotely having to do with you know, language. So, um, you know, we have efficient um, and useful natural language processing systems now based on very crude models of, of language. In vision, I work with some of the best people in the world. They can't even recognize a cow. Um, you know, they recognize images of cows maybe with an accuracy of, of, of about 20%. They can recognize faces okay, but only if you stand right in front of the camera. Right? So free uh, you know, throwing you know, images is essentially hopeless. So at, at this point, I'm not even clear um, how much they can teach us. Um, concretely, I mean, this idea, of course, of course going inside from all, all mm. these fields is, is perfectly you know, sensible. But it's not clear concretely what it can actually teach us. Yeah, uh, I think this is an interesting comment. Uh, this is the last slide, as you so I didn't go into, but da David Marr is mentioned on this slide. Um, precisely because I think. Uh, in part, what the vision literature has also showed us is that um, we should we should also be r realistic about the sort of data that we can actually capture uh, when we try to actually um, uh, develop models that are biologically sound. Um, and I think that the problem in the case of uh, of linguistics is precisely because we are not quite clear but what we want to capture in terms of phenomena. Most linguists uh, that go into uh, this field of uh, biolinguistics or uh, you know biology of language are still trying to account for dative case in Icelandic uh, and I think that uh, that's not a that's not gonna arise from uh, looking at complex systems. So one of the things we should do uh, which I haven't touched on is also lower our standards of what are the phenomena that we want to capture. Um, and I think that if we do that in parallel with um, learning from the other fields, we may have, we may, we can be more optimistic than you are. Uh, but I think the linguists have also mm, to be clearer about what they want to capture. And here I think they have been way too specific uh, in. Yeah, um, uh, there I think we disagree. So you're advocating for a type of linguistics without language? No, 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 no. Um, I'm advocating a linguistics that focuses on the language faculty, not specific languages. Yeah. Hmm? In many ways, I mean, in, uh, I mean, you mentioned them in the question that you made after the first talk. I mean, not you need not just rely on specific examples from specific languages. There's other fields to draw, you know, inferences from and evidence from. That's fine. Okay, well, we have to stop here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Bruce. Thank you.